There we go. We're still waiting for the computer to do whatever it needs to do to go live. Seems to be live now. There we go. Oh, and Des is coming on. There you go. And there's Andy. Okay. It's telling me that it's redirecting us to YouTube. I don't know if you can already see it on YouTube. No, we see it. it looks like it's streaming. We look good. Streaming? Yep. All right. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to kick it off. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. All righty. So welcome to Headlines. As uh, some of you may know who've done this before, it's a very organic, relaxed conversation between colleagues. And really the point of it is to create a sense of community, to create uh, the ability for us to know each other in some ways that we already uh, recognize, like our academic work, and in ways that some of us don't know our personal lives. And uh, so it's a very uh, conversational uh, way of uh, talking about ourselves, we're going to have each of the pairs that were set up. Uh, one will introduce the other and then they'll reverse and there'll be an opportunity to talk about your uh, work life and your not work life. And there'll be a question from your pair uh, partner and uh, you'll see it goes very smoothly. It's a little bit difficult to understand if you map it out, but it flows very well. Um, if we think that people are being too enthusiastic about their work life, we may, uh, we may interrupt you just to keep things moving along because we want to get everybody uh, into dinner or breakfast, depending on which uh, coast you're on right now. Uh, so I think the first uh, partner uh, pair is Nick introducing Tiffany and then it'll reverse. So uh, Isabel is going to show the slides that will help to prompt the conversation. It's my pleasure to introduce Tiffany Hodges. She is a uh, physician and neurosurgeon down at Case Western Reserve University, uh, which is in uh, Cleveland Medical Center. She's an assistant professor of neurosurgery and also the associate uh, program director for the residency program down there. Um, I, that's what she gave me. I also know she does brain and spine oncology as well. So also interested in the same things that I'm interested in, I think. So we can maybe talk about that as well. And I'm just going to jot in and saying that within the executive committee, Tiffany is the chair of our uh, Washington uh, subcommittee um, uh, and uh, a very important role, therefore. Thank you, Nick. Awesome. Thank you, Nick and Isabel, for the introduction. Um, I just have a key slide here from a current clinical study that we're working on evaluating the clinical and treatment outcomes of patients with brain metastases secondary to gynecological malignancies, which is pretty rare. Um, the objective of our study was to further characterize these treatment outcomes for this patient population. So we reviewed our own institutional data over a 20 year period since 2001, and we were able to collect data on 66 patients with brain metastasis in the setting of gynecological malignancy. And we evaluated um, survival analysis uh, using the Kaplan-Meier method. Um, interestingly, most of the malignancies that we evaluated were cervical, ovarian, and endometrial, um, as well as some other subtypes, including fallopian tube and vulvar. Um, but interestingly, overall survival did not differ significantly uh, by the primary cancer site. Um, but here I wanted to highlight a couple of graphs um, from our data. Overall on the left, we found that there was a difference in median survival and the number of brain metastases. So those patients who had one brain metastasis at initial diagnosis uh, tend to do worse compared to those patients uh, with more than 10 brain metastases. In addition, on the right, we found that patients with extracranial disease at diagnosis had an overall lower median survival. So um, a difference of 18.7 months compared to 3.8 months. Um, just so that you're aware, these patients, about a third of these patients underwent some type of neurosurgical procedure. So they had either resection, whether it was gross total or subtotal versus biopsy, and then some type of post-operative radiation um, therapy later. Um, the rest of the patients uh, with brain metastasis underwent some form of radiotherapy alone, whether it was whole brain, radiation, stereotactic radiation, or both during their disease course. 
Um, what's not highlighted here um, is that um, stereotac those patients who underwent stereotactic radio surgery tend to do better than the patients who underwent whole brain radiotherapy. Uh, we're unsure of why, but um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of these slides just to, sh to show you um, that we're evaluating uh, these, this patient population. Um, our next steps are to actually evaluate the tumor tissue and um, perform genetic and molecular testing on the um, brain metastasis themselves and hopefully be able to compare that data with the primary tumor site as well. So that's an ongoing study. Um, so thank you for allowing me to share that data with you today. Good work. Go ahead. I think, sorry, I think, you know, the question I have is, uh, you know, do you see this becoming like part of a treatment algorithm for this disease, histology? And like, what do the most of the patients die from? Is it from the brain disease or is it from the external disease? And do you think that'll come into the play in the algorithm treatment algorithm? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's something that we're currently evaluating. We find that the patients who do worse are the patients who have multiple brain metastases, but eventually they succumb to their primary disease um, overall. Um, it's interestingly interesting because we are doing this study in collaboration with gynecolo gynecology oncology, as well as radiation oncology. And our hope is to create more of a multidisciplinary uh, team strategy to be able to treat these patients um, and to be able to get them to treatment faster um, uh, in the setting of you know, newly diagnosed brain metastases. Um, 66 patients over the course of 20 years um, is actually um, is low compared to you know, uh, breast metastases, lung metastases, et cetera. But we're seeing more and more of these patients because they're surviving longer um, than they used to uh, previously. Um, but that's a very good question, Nick. Okay, and uh, it's also gonna advance the Oops. slide. Yep. Oops. Whoops, we don't have the personal things here. What happened? <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, I don't know what happened. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit, Tiffany? And I'm gonna just uh, try to get the uh, the slides back on. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Let's see if I can. So this is the time where I talk about- uh, About you. Yeah. So, <laughs> about you. So uh, personal so personal tidbits. Um, uh, I enjoy gardening. So that's one of my major hobbies. I have a full-on garden in our backyard that we've been working on for two years. I have a picture I'd love to show you guys. Um, so I've harvested everything from cucumber, okra, watermelon, um, greens, lettuce, tomatoes, you name it, we have it. So if anybody's ever in Cleveland, they're more than welcome to come by and uh, grab some uh, fruits or vegetables. Um, as far as two facts and one fiction, um, basically I played singles on the tennis team in high school. Um, I won a trophy for skeet shooting and fishing uh, last year. Um, and I have not had caffeine for several months. Um, so uh, the last, uh, the first two are correct and the last one <laughs> is fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, you went too fast. First of all, congratulations <laughs> on that gorgeous picture with the vegetables um, and my apologies for being slow in showing it. But uh, I want to hear from Nick, if you had to pick, now you already know the answer, but Nick, what, what do you think it's not fitting here? <laughs> I would have gone against skeet shooting, but I'm not sure where Tiffany's from. So, but uh, <laughs> surgeon caffeine is also, uh, you know, stable. So that could also, <laughs> <laughs> I believe the tennis. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty much right. I, I did place, uh, actually, that's not true. The, the first one is not true. I actually played doubles tennis in high school. Yes. All right. So there was an error there. Okay. Yes. <laughs> there you go. And it's true. I have not had caffeine for several months. All right. Um, so, Tiffany, now, do you want to introduce uh, Nick? Yes, definitely. So, um, so I'd like to uh, return uh, the favor to Nick and introduce uh, Nick Zerlup, who's professor of neurosurgery and director of the Spine Oncology Program at the University of Michigan. He serves on the tumor section as chair of the Spine Subcommittee. And so I will turn it over to Nick. Thanks, Tiffany. So 
Uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of my research. I, yeah, I could have done this for hours, but I'll try and do it in four minutes or two minutes. Uh, you know, I run the spine on program and we have large like clinical kind of endeavors and research endeavors. So I'm just going to quickly talk about one of the recent things we're doing in the lab, uh, looking at particularly the biology of the bone marrow and the immune cells. We're trying to understand a little better about why tumors grow better in the spine than doing long bones. So we kind of took a step back and this paper has looked at the just the differences in immune cells in the vertebral body compared to the difference in immune cell populations in the long bones using CYTOF, which is a, a mass cytometry, um, like that's kind of flow, but with cytometry with a mass spec instead of flow cytometry. So you get a lot more, a lot more immune, uh, immune cells to look at. So a lot more colors, basically. It's like flow with a million different colors, but not really colors. Uh, but we found some interesting things that the, the immune system is very different in the long bones of the vertebral bodies. Uh, we found upregulation of uh, cytokines, uh, CXCL2, IL-13, IL-10, IL-6, all in the vertebral body. Then CXCL9 was higher in the long bones in the top. And what interesting is about those is the first four on the left are things that kind of attract and, and regulate MDSC and neutrophil activation and, and uh, migration. And CXCL9 is something that inhibits that. And so then when you look at the cell population differences between the two, you can kind of see that where we see that there's a lot more MDSCs, modest myeloid cells in the vertebral bodies and maybe neutrophils. And that's what we're looking into because a lot of, you look at the, how you label MDSC myeloid cells, neutrophils, they overlap a lot. So we're doing some investigation to see exactly what these cell populations are. And we've just developed a tumor model that will let us look at how these immune cell populations change when tumor cells get to the vertebral bodies versus the lung bone. So. Uh, that's the next stage of this uh, endeavor. Thanks, Nick. Uh, one quick question, um, kind of what is the difference between the long bone and vertebral body um, as far as uh, you being able to utilize that uh, for your potential uh, preclinical models? Um, I'm assuming mouse models. Yeah, you know, it's very hard. There's not any good, really good models of uh, bone metastases. So in the past, everything published just kind of gloms everything together, vertebral bodies and long bones. So this was the first one to look at them separately, I think. And so we're trying to develop a bone model that we're using breast because it goes better. And we were trying to prostate for years and just couldn't get a good model in immune competent mice that would develop it. So we just switched to breast line and developed four T1s that actually go to the bone. And right now it does look like they actually go to the spine more than the long bones. So we're gonna see what the difference is there's probably some tropism effect, it's probably related to some vascular, why they go to the spine more, but we find already that they grow better in the spine too. And that may be re uh, related to the MDSCs. Some of those immune cells may have some inhibitory, uh, um, like some inhibitory effects or some like pro-growth effect, right? And that's also in the vertebral body. And we've done some other work looking at dura and the cytokines released by dura, which also relate to increasing the growth of tumor cells. So it's a different microenvironment. We got to figure out what's exactly different. And then hopefully when we start getting into preclinical models in clinical models, we can actually take the bone marrow from patients when we operate and then look at those changes in patients. And this paper also had some patient data as well, uh, which we looked at the differences in, in humans as well. We saw a similar difference. And this, so, I'm Nick, don't give it away. Yeah, <laughs> this is a picture of my family, but not all of them. Because as, as Vivian knows, she has a teenager, I think, by now, if I remember correctly. So my teenage son will never get pictured. So he's, he's not in the picture. So We've had a few daughter. of those, Nick. Don't worry about it. We've had a few that yeah. have said the same thing. Well, my daughter and my wife, my wife's, you know, to be about her is also, she's the more known surgeon scientist of the two of us. Uh, in vascular surgeries, and everybody knows who she is. And so my fact or fiction, so member of two athletics hall of fame. Uh, play the baritone saxophone, and I published a book on poetry. So those are my facts or fiction. <laughs> All right, let's see uh, what the public thinks. And uh, as we're doing that, we're going to launch the um, poll. And uh, Tiffany, Paul is now available to answer. And okay. Tiffany, you can uh, tell us what, what are your thoughts. So with, sorry, before we go, um, yeah. This says true or fake. Which one am I picking? The one that I think is fake, right? 
You're picking okay. the fake one because the other two are good. Okay. So Tiffany, at the present time, we have uh, two, um, number one, choice number one, um, actually choice number one, two, and three um, that uh, could be uh, uh, false. Um, we have a 40%, 40%, and 20%. So it's up to you to decide now. Um, I'm gonna go with choice three. So I put that in there because, you know, I worked with Dr. Tabar in, in fellowship. She knows I'm a horrible writer. <laughs> I wasn't going to give you away, Nick, but I knew the answer to this. <laughs> I'm <almost laughs> writing outside of so, so I am a member of two Hall of Fames, the Columbia University Wrestling Athletics Hall of Fame, New York Wrestling Hall of Fame, and then I do play fair. So, so. Nick, what Hall of Fames? Uh, Columbia University Athletics Hall of Fame. And For what? my undergrad for wrestling and then the wrestling. New York State Wrestling Hall of Fame. The well, gentlest, I, gentlest, awesome. best uh, neurosurgeon wrestler ever. <laughs> A unique combination. Yes, indeed, yes. Excellent, so we're moving on, right? To the next yep. uh, pair so and that would be Des. Pair is uh, Des will be introducing Vivian. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. So uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Vivian Tabar. Uh, she is uh, the chair uh, of the Department of Neurosurgery, um, the Theresa Fend and Doe Chair in Neurosurgical Oncology, um, and member of the program in Cancer Biology and Genetics, uh, all at Memor Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, I think a little institution we've all never heard of. Um, and uh, I'm looking very much uh, forward to hearing what she's going to show to us. And within Thank the EC, uh, Vivian is uh, an active member of our education committee. Absolutely. Thank you, Des. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you both, Susan and Isabel, for organizing this. It's so much fun. Um, no, that would be Des. Oh, that would be Des. <laughs> yes. Tonight, I think that... Uh, I my... couldn't talk about Celia, please. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get uh, reorganized then and uh, make sure that we're showing the correct slides. Okay, I think I got you now. This, this was just to be sure that um, you knew which one were your slides. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's me. Um, so yes, I work at a cancer center. And so my clinical practice is all brain tumor all the time. And some of my lab uh, works on brain tumors as well. There's a big place in my heart for brain repair and regeneration, which is where I did my most of my science work is, um, but um, so I work on human embryonic stem cells or human pluripotent stem cells and have spent the last 20 years of my life figuring out how to um, develop a strategy to rebuild the brain in the clinic. I worked with the, a lot of people, but most recently we finally uh, brought a um, clinical trial to graft embryonic stem cell derived midbrain dopamine neurons in Parkinson uh, disease patients. Um, we published our preclinical data in cell stem cell and worked extremely hard to get an IND. I'm happy to say that we opened the trial last year in May and uh, we actually finished recruiting in one year, which was really remarkable in view of the pandemic. Um, it was just wonderful to see uh, the patients and their excitement for science. Um, and so um, I am with bated breath awaiting to see how, how we do, even though this was a, obviously a phase one safety study. Uh, but again, because I cannot run away from brain tumors, I um, uh, also worked on modeling brain tumors using human pluripotent stem cells. We 
focused on DIPG because of their uh, developmental window, the fact that they happen very early. So you can make uh, early neural stem cells from human um, embryonic stem cells in the ditch. And that helped us dissect uh, cells of origin and some mechanisms um, uh, by which histone mutations could um, result in tumors. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this, but um, it's exciting work. It's at the edge of uh, neurodevelopment and oncology, and uh, I'm just incredibly grateful for um, all these uh, brilliant young people in my lab who make this happen. Um, I guess I'm supposed to talk about my personal. Yeah, yeah no, I guess I was I guess supposed to ask, to ask you a question, question first. Yep. Oh, yeah. sorry. He's coming up with a really spicy question. I can see it coming. <laughs> Not, no. <laughs> I mean, this, this work is just so awesome. I mean, what do you ask, right? I mean, uh, so I guess what I would love to know is what you're able to tell us um, about the way that these dopaminergic neurons might be applied clinically. Just kind of educate us. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, people have known for a very, very long time that Parkinson's disease can, is, is the consequence of degeneration of midbrain dopamine neurons. And this has been a pipe dream for a long time. You might know that there's been fetal grafts, you know, taking midbrain fetal cells, place them in the striatum for Parkinson's. There's been even adrenal medullary graft and cell line grafts to try and replace the neurons. What you can do with human uh, embryonic stem cells is make actually neurons that you can confirm in the dish that they function. Um, you do optogenetics, you do physiology, you do all kinds of characterization and graft them back in the brain. And we know from animal models that these neurons will integrate in the brain and rebuild circuitry. So the idea is to see literally if you can repair the brain with the right uh, neuronal subtype. And there's a lot of interest to expand. There's incredible work going on. Uh, about um, using uh, or grafting glia or grafting uh, microglia as a way to modulate uh, the immune microenvironment. Um, and all of these can be made from human pluripotent stem cells, expanded, analyzed, uh, quality certified before you use them. Great. Can, can I ask one? Isabel, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Isabel's bringing up the hidden side of <laughs> Vivian, but go ahead. It sounds like you have one more question. Go ahead, Des. Yeah, I just wanted to know. So how are your specific cells sort of engineered to be different? Or is it just that they are the same sort of expanded dopaminergic neurons that have met CGMP type um, requirements? Or are they modified specifically in some way to confer specific advantages. Yeah. So in brief, the beauty of these cells is that they can be differentiated from a pluripotent state into a specific fate, such as dopamine neuron, without genetic manipulation, which increases usually the, the safety risk and the regulatory uh, oversight. So you basically emulate development in the dish. You ventralize the cells by exposing them to your molecule I'm sure you love, sonic hedgehog. So to make midbrain dopamine, you gotta go ventral, you gotta be in the middle of the brain. And as you know, every cell in the brain has coordinates related to its fate. Um, you wanna make motor neurons, you ventralize and you push further to, towards the hindbrain. So it's really exposure to growth factors and um, em embryo embryologically relevant uh, molecules and the right sequence will result in this differentiation without any um, uh, engineering with uh, viruses or otherwise. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you All for right. the questions. The family food slide, go ahead. Go I ahead. know, I, I can't believe I put so many pictures, but I miss we my kids, you know, they're both teenagers. We love it, we love it. Uh, this is Yara. I'm responsible for the hair uh, color. She, she loves blue and looks good on her. She is a college student, a freshman, just finished a freshman year here in town at Barnard, and she wants to become a clinical psychologist. And Alexander is my um, uh, firstborn. He is a, finishing up at MIT next year as a, a computer and electrical engineer. 
He has always loved machines, as you can see behind him. And I miss him a lot. He's in California doing a summer internship. Um, and my facts and fiction, well, I'm a great cook. I have trypophobia and I'm a classical pianist. So don't tell us, don't tell us what, oh, uh, what it is. <laughs> survey says, go ahead. Okay, and uh, let's, survey, yeah. let's, see, let's see what the, uh, what people think in the audience. So there are a lot of people thinking about uh, uh, the choice number two, three, and now choice number one. We have a, we have a split, even split, 33%. So Des, uh -oh. you don't get any help from the audience here. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. Uh <laughs> So I am going to go with uh, choice number two, just because I think, you know, uh, you seem more awesome than a phobia. <laughs> <laughs> you are awesome yourself. Well, you know, uh, the great cook and the pianist, uh, well, I'll just say cook and pianist are real. I love classical music. I love to cook. Whether I'm good is up for discussion. So that, you know, skirts fact and fiction. But I definitely have trypophobia. Oh. <laughs> Always had it. Never knew the name. And my daughter clued me in that there is such a thing. But it's so bad that if I'm in surgery, if I see arachnoid granulations, you know, that's, I cannot look. <laughs> so, <laughs> That one, is, that, that one is a definite fact. Was that a cross section of a beef Wellington? Yeah. Say again? Was that a cross section of a beef Wellington in the bottom left corner? Yes, it is. And it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, good. Wow. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so. So which one, gonna... so which one is false then? Uh, the, the the classical pianist. I mean, the I play the piano, pianist. but I'm okay. not by Fair any enough. means a, a classical <laughs> pianist. <laughs> who, who is your favorite uh, classical artist? Pianist, you mean? Yes. Uh, well, among the living, it's Grigory Sokolov, and among the departed is uh, Sviatoslav Richter, who's amazing and sort of an idol. Oh, and I'm a big fan of Martha Argerich, too. My okay. hope is me next month, hopefully. Fair. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Well, your turn now. I'm yep. absolutely thrilled to be introducing uh, Dr. Desmond Brown, who is an MD and a PhD, a young neurosurgeon. He also leads the neurosurgical oncology unit at another not very well-known institution called the uh, National Institutes of Neurological Disorder and Stroke at NIH. And I'm absolutely thrilled to hear what you have to tell us. Awesome. And let me just say that Des is also part of the uh, executive committee and his uh, role is uh, on the research subcommittee. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you, Isabel. So, um, so this is uh, a, a single slide I, I put together from a paper we are submitting currently. Um, so basically, I am interested in uh, an organelle called the primary cilium, which basically, um, the way that I think about it is it's almost like a zip code where a lot of really important signal transduction cascades need to go in order for it to happen, right? And so these are a lot of the pathways that you would have heard about in developmental biology, things like sonic hedgehog and wind and notched and so on. But, but also the same pathways that then become really critically important uh, in many pathologies, but definitely in cancer. Um, and so one of the advantages of, I, I believe anyway, of thinking about the primary cilia as far as cancer signaling goes is that instead of targeting single pathways or single protein protein interactions or single kinases, it gives you an opportunity to sort of step back, uh, sort of take the bird's eye view, and you might be able to regulate much larger pathways, but still having to only target maybe a single molecule if you're regulating the way that cilia are working, for example. And so I thought this may be potentially a whole new sort of uh, therapeutic avenue for many diseases, but primarily for glioblastoma is where my interest is. So what you're seeing on the slide here that we're currently getting, uh, we're currently preparing to send out 
Um, this is actually from a bioinformatics portion of the work. And essentially what we asked was that, you know, since primary cilia are so sort of critical, like it's an organelle, right? So it's critical to the cell. The cell actually uh, devotes much of your ATP to breaking this organelle down every cell cycle because it's attached to the basal body and then rebuilding it because it's that critical every cell cycle. So what the question we asked was, would you find if we looked at gliomas that, you know, if you took just genes that were structural genes important for building the primary cilium, would you find that essentially all the tumors regulate uh, these genes in the same way because it's essential or would there be sort of clusters of tumors that may, you know, regulate their primary cilia in different ways? And so essentially what you're finding on the upper left is that what, what we found using two independent databases, both the TCGA and the CCGA, we essentially found the same thing, that we got these four clusters um, of gliomas that regulate their cilia. And um, what you see is that there is implication here in terms of survival of those patients. What I'm not showing you here, uh, just for brevity, is that when we then went and did a, a multivariate analysis to ask, well, what about, is this just reflecting um, things that we already know to be prognosticators, things like MGMT and IDH wild type status and 1P19Q status, et cetera. If we control for all those things, do we still see a difference in survival based solely on the ciliary cluster? And the answer is yes, from all these databases. And basically what we then did was we did a lot of, you know, machine learning and uh, bootstrap analysis and essentially picked out some of the genes and pathways that are really critical um, uh, downstream of these structural ciliary genes that really define these different clusters and open up some ideas of places we can go and things we can look at. And those are those network figures that you're seeing on the right. At this point, we've refined this down a lot more. We've re reduced the numbers and, and found some commonalities that we are now pursuing um, both in a prospective study to validate this in the patients that I operate on and then take the tissues, um, but also looking retrospectively since we have the, um, at NIH, all of our patients, regardless of why they're here, get fully genetically sequenced. So then we have that uh, 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 as a resource that we can then go and, and validate this both retrospectively and prospectively, which is what we're doing now. That's it. Fantastic. So I guess I can, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask one. <laughs> so um, do all cells have cilia? Just for the audience to get on board with this. And yes. then, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, they do. Surprising. I learned that, you know, a few years ago from Catherine Anderson. Um, so yeah. developmental biologist here who focused yeah. on Celia most of her life. I consider her my scientific grandmother because my guy <laughs> at Princeton she is, trained in her lab. Yes, I'm aware. She's a wonderful yeah. person also. It was a big inspiration for me. Um, tell her, this is a really awkward question and, and maybe nobody did this experiment, but yeah, I, I wonder, do, do, are Celia different in glioma, for example, in situ when the glioblastoma is in the tissue surrounded by the microenvironment versus when you make cell lines? So that's a fantastic question. And I have some indirect answers for you. So firstly, um, a part of the way that uh, primary um, cilia are regulated in GBM and other tumors is that um, because there's such a close relationship between form and function, much of what gliomas do actually uh, modulate the form, all right, the morphology. And so what we know from many ultrastructural studies that have been done, including the Moser study back in the 60s with electron microscopy, is that in gliomas, the actual morphology is different, right? Um, now, when we take those um, to, the, to the lab and we grow cultures, um, you know, we see morphologic changes and I think they're quite similar in terms of the morphology of the cilia itself. I actually um, have recorded like electron microscopy from tissue sections and cells and we see pretty much the same thing. They're a little bulbous, they're rounded um, and so on. Incidentally, 
a part of my PhD work when I was at Princeton was I, I cloned the first CCRK now called CDK20 mouse. Um, and, at the, and at the time, it, you know, CDK20 because of, um, you know, the way that it uh, had homology to the cyclin dependent kinases, um, we now know it doesn't really do that. And what we actually found was that, you know, the cilia are all bulbous and, and structurally abnormal. And fast forward through uh, neurosurgery residency, I come back many years later only to find out that uh, CCRK is an oncogene overexpressed in like 70% of gliomas. And so that probably is the reason why I'm bringing this up. One of the ways in which that morphology gets uh, altered, it's through, uh, might be through those, some of those interactions. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Here's the true falses. Right. So I, I guess the one, the two above are just things. I grew up in Jamaica. I, I came to uh, the U.S. Uh, pretty early, and I have a big family with five kids. And I think the true false ones are the ones below. <laughs> so why don't you read them out loud, and then uh, I will uh, set the poll. All right. Fair enough. So I'm an excellent jazz pianist, and I perform semi-professionally. I'm a karate black belt and have competed in martial arts professionally. And I'm a pilot and I enjoy flying airplanes. I see the piano theme coming, right? <laughs> I, need, right. I need help from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, results are coming in and I think there is a slight um, more a number of people saying uh helping you vivian saying that he's not a pilot that is what the audience thinks what do you think well i know he must be a pianist based on the questions he asked me and um i think if you have five kids it's kind of tough to be a pilot although he could have been in his pre-kids life but i'll go with that <laughs> So which one are you saying? Just so we're clear. Not the pilot is not real. <laughs> <laughs> Will you put the slides up again one more time? The choices oh, again? It's, of it's course. Yes, piano, uh, pilot, and um, karate. Oh, no. And like the karate, karate, that's okay, got it, yep, okay. So the the falls one here is that I'm an excellent jazz pianist. Oh. Um, I grew up playing classical piano. And when I got to college, I auditioned for jazz and everything I heard was you should play classical. <laughs> so I quit. I am a very bad jazz pianist. I'm still learning. The other two are true. Well, it, it, technically, all of them are true. You are a pianist too. So congratulations. That's awesome. Amazing. All right. So now we have Andy will introduce Lissa. First of all, uh, is it is it Lisa or Lissa? Lissa. Lissa. All right. I just I wasn't 100 percent sure. Uh, I've never met Lissa, but she is the fellows family chair of neurosurgery uh, and associate professor of neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. She's the director of neurosurgical oncology, as well as the co-director of the Brain Tumor Center at uh, Boston Children's and the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I'll let Isabel talk about her uh, joint section posts. And in the executive committee for the uh, joint section of tumor, Lisa is our co-chair for pediatrics. Thank you both. Terrific. Thanks. Well, um... I, I think I must have interpreted this question a little different than anyone else. I kind of, I kind of put just a brief blurb about you know the the major things I do. Um, but this is fine too. It's fine too. It's <laughs> whatever we, whatever we want. Yep, it's whatever you want it to be. So on the science end of things, um, this is just some work that I'm I'm pretty excited about right now that I do in collaboration with. Shin Tang, who's a, a brilliant neuroscientist in our department that I, I get to work with. Um, just looking at neuroimmune tumor interactions with a human brain organoid model and doing some gene editing of, of the microglia in the model to kind of look for ways to improve tumor detection and clearance of tumor cells um, and just studying the immune microenvironment in this model for different types of tumors. Um, 
And on the clinical side of things, um, I'm the co-director of our, our uh, joint institutional uh, brain tumor center with Mariella Philbin. And we've, we've recently um, had a, a massive project of, of joining the centers of the two institutions and really creating platforms for, for research and clinical care um, across all of these uh, research institutions in this, in this very um, huge environment that's, that's here um, with, with many, many people. So that's, that's been a big focus lately. We're kind of expanding our our programs and, and two of my um, focus programs are the school-based program and the Infant Brain Tumor Center. And um, when I came here a couple of years ago from, from Portland, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that we've worked on is to grow our school-based program, which in pediatrics is um, you know, chordomas and craniopharyngiomas and, and orbital tumors, a little bit different than the adult pathology. So, yeah, a little, little blurb about those two arms. And I see Andy has a question burning in his head. Well, I have many questions. I think this many is a really interesting area of research. Um, so when you say uh, brain tumor immune interactions, um, do you mean that you're, you're, so you're creating organoids, are you then taking immune cells in vitro and trying to see how they interact or are you referring to the fact that you're fusing, you're making an organoid by fusing a, a tumor cell with a microglial cell? Is that is that? What? Yeah, we've we've created the model of um, of the, the microglia are not infused from like humans or other you know or mice or anything. It's part of the model. They're they're grown from stem cells, and then we're modulating those microglia um, that have been fused with. with <clears throat> tumor spheres in human lines in different pathologies, high grade mostly. So are you, is this a, so are you taking patients and fusing them with their own micro, the, the patient no. tumor and no. the, the same microglia or their, their allergy? Not yet, no, th but that may be something we do down the road. Down the road. So, so these are microglia that, that we developed from stem cells that are part of the organoid model. So from embryonic stem cells? Yes. Interesting. Very interesting. And so that's what, what, why, I think this is a very interesting, how, why do you, you know, these general two not as with the microglia, what, how, what will this tell us? How is this? I mean, I think it's very interesting that you're doing this. What, what do you express? Sorry, you were breaking up a little bit for me, but um, yeah, I mean, our, our our goal we have like some some different sub sub projects within within this larger project, but our our goal is is ultimately to understand the interactions between the microglia in in the you know immune microenvironment and mainly how are they able are we able to augment them, which is why we're doing some gene editing of different pathways and we're looking at all of the receptor ligand interactions with different uh, tumor lines and and just kind of trying to understand that interaction better and see what what can be augmented what can be manipulated um, how how things change maybe in different therapeutic environments i think that's really, uh, you know one of the, the big questions always in immunotherapy is can you augment the immune micro told me yeah particularly focusing on microenvironment and uh, on, uh, I'm sorry, microglial cells. And uh, I haven't seen a lot of work on this lately. Fascinating and very encouraging. So uh, congratulations on that. Well, thanks. It's, it's an interesting um, project so far. All right. So a little bit of the the unknown side. So, of the so uh, <laughs> I, I was late with my slides. And when Isabel sent me another reminder, I'm so sorry, but this is where I was. <laughs> and so I thought it appropriate to, uh, to include some snapshots of where, where I was at the time, which was at a, our family home in Maui. And now I, it's just kind of depressing because I had to come <laughs> home, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, um, I have a lot of family from 
from Hawaii and and uh, try to spend as much time there as I can. And, so, and who's that cute baby? That's my cute niece, Olivia. Wow. Wow. So two Thanks. facts, one fiction. Um, I have 16 nieces and nephews and I grew up in New York City. And before neurosurgery, I was a semi-professional cellist, keeping with the music theme here. Okay, let's see what uh, people think before, uh, before uh, Andy gives it a shot. Which is false? One, two, or three? Isabella, it was nieces what do they and say? nephews. Nieces so, and nephews was one, right? And the people are going for the grew up in New York City as New the New York wrong City is one. Two. Yep. You know, I think I'm going to go with New York City because, uh, you know, you can never. There's so many neurosurgeons who are uh, musically adept, so I, I think that's very likely to be true. Uh, and uh, we already know that she has a family home in Hawaii and has at least one niece, <laughs> very young. So I'm just by deduction, I'm gonna say New York City is wrong. You are correct, <laughs> New York City is wrong. I do have 16 nieces and nephews and, and uh, yeah, big, big family. Um, and uh, I did some school in New York City but did not grow up there. And I do play the cello and before neurosurgery did did play quite a bit. So wow. All right. So Lisa, we're going to flip the tables and you're going to introduce Andy. All right. So this is um Dr. Andrew Sloan, but who do you go by Andy? Andy. Yeah. Whatever you Andy, Drew, Andrew. Call me anything you right. <laughs> so Dr. Sloan is the Peter Crystal Chair of Neuro-Oncology and the Director of the Brain Tumor and Neuro-Oncology Center and the Director of the Center for Translational Neuro-Oncology at uh, Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. So he also serves as the Chair of the Coding and Reimbursement Subcommittee on the Executive Committee. And right, Andy, and we're gonna Isabel's show your slide, the exactly. The slides. There we go. There we go. So this is a bit of a complicated slide, but uh, I'm, I'm talking, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, a study that I did, uh, which also leads up to a study that we're about to do. So on the left, you see uh, a, a slide that I, I think is probably familiar to everyone in the audience. It's the Stoop 2005 data from uh, New England Journal of Medicine on the left, and then Monica Heggie's work uh, on the right, where she identified, where, where Stoop shows that concurrent radiochemotherapy improves both median and long-term survival in a subset of GBMs uh, compared to radiotherapy alone, which at the time, uh, at the at time when many of these people were probably still in high school, uh, Isabella, uh, was the standard of care. Uh, and then Monica Heggie showed that while the, the, that overall data was true, uh, the, real, uh, the real fundamental observation is that you if, with the patients with MGMT promoter methylations, the ones that did not make MGMT, which of, of course repairs the DNA adox with temozolomide, they actually had nearly a two year median survival. And in the other group, which unfortunately is more common, about 55 to 60%, although the overall slide that Stoop showed is true, they actually, those, that subgroup of patients, which again is larger, got very little boost. They went from 11.7 median survival to 12.7 months median survival. And so everyone thought, wow, MGMP is such an important target. What can we do to hit it? And uh, a number of groups, including the Duke group, came uh, identified a, a drug called O6 benzoguanine, which uh, irreversibly acetylates uh, MGMT uh, and uh, knocks it out. And what the Duke group and others found was the patients who survived the treatment did really well, but therein lies the rub: highly toxic, knocked out their bone marrow. Uh, Lots of 
medical issues and basically it was not well tolerated and it went by the wayside. And so people forgot about it. Uh, at the time I was being recruited to case, uh, the, the Stan Gerson, who at the time was our cancer center director, is now the dean of the School of Medicine, had, had spent most of his life working on MGMT. He's not particularly interested in GBM, truth be told. But it turns out that uh, around that time, basically people knew that MGMT was not important in lung or breast or prostate or anything else but brain tumors. And so we we're talking about this during this interview. And he mentioned that he had this mutant and he originally thought that this might be uh, useful as a sort of a gene therapy decoy, but he was completely throwing, you know, changing his lab focus. He said, you know, this obviously has no use because you obviously can't do clinical trials in glioma. And I said, wait a second. And so we spent about uh, eight years developing this protocol where we took genetically engineered, we, we took autologous hematopoietic stem cells, genetically engineered them to express this mutant, which you see up on the, the middle, the top middle slide uh, that has a, basically it's just a steric hindrance. So it doesn't block O6BG. Then you genetically engineer these hematopoietic stem cells, you re uh, and then you re-infuse them. And the, the protocol here is on the top right. Uh, and then because they go to the bone marrow, you can then do dose escalation of benzoguanine and temozolomide, starting with the, the standard dose and essentially doubling it for each of six cycles of therapy. And so on the uh, bottom, you find the results. This was a 10 patient phase one trial. Uh, so the, the, the primary goal of phase one is, is safety and feasibility. And we showed it was safe and feasible uh, it's hard to talk really about overall survival in a phase one because there's no control group. But we mm -hmm. used, since we've done a lot of work with brain to, uh, GBM nomograms, uh, as well as there's an RPA predicted survival uh, that can be computed for various patients based on various factors. We, we sort of s tried to see if we could handicap our survival based on this. And what we found was uh, of the first 10 patients, all of them tolerated it pretty well. We had one patient who didn't quite as long as, ex as is expected, but the other nine lived longer. And in fact, one is still alive, working full time with a KPS of 90, uh, about eight years out. Uh, the median survival was about three and a half fold higher than predicted. Uh, based on this very data, just opened uh, to phase body CI uh, and just now and with a somewhat cohort with our bio we're, we're really excited about this because I think this might actually traction. Oh, that's really great. And is this an oral drug or is it an IV infusion? Oh, so it's, it's, it's not, well, so O6BG has to be infused as do the uh, engineered hematopoietic stem cell. They have to be infused. And so they're, each time they get the drug? No, you only do this. Or is that just a one-time? G has to use cycle therapy. So you still give temozolomide, which is obviously oral, but then the O6BG uh, is infused intravenous. Okay, so we have a cute dog situation over here. Go ahead, go, Andy. Well, uh, you know, I, I have a, a lovely family, but uh, I, both my teenage son and my wife don't always like to be photographed, although I think they're both uh, <laughs> exceptionally... Uh, <laughs> uh, my son, Duke, agreed to be photographed. Uh, and so this is our, this is my youngest and four-legged son, a chocolate lab, who is my wife's constant companion since my wife uh, mainly now works remotely and uh, Duke stays in her office to keep her company. And these are my facts and fictions. Uh, one, I rode on the crew team in college. Two, I love to play piano in my spare time. 
And three, I was very close to becoming a transplant surgeon. Okay, let's see if um, we can give you some help with the poll. At least some people are still thinking. Uh, there is now a hint that I love to uh, play piano in my spare time is the falls. I think I'm going to go with number three as being the falls, that you almost became a transplant surgeon. Well, I think you saw the, the crowd was right. And unfortunately, you were wrong. I was I actually <laughs> was very close to being a transplant surgeon. But uh, anyone who's heard me play the piano knows that number two is false. <laughs> Unlike most nurses. You're breaking, you're you're breaking the theme. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like we're heading toward the 7 p.m. mark. And uh, I just wanted to thank all you guys for uh, giving us a chance to know you all a little bit better, both professionally and personally. It's really fascinating to us to hear about, uh, about your lives and, and the kind of the hidden side of, of you, which is actually almost as interesting, if not more maybe, than the part that we see uh, in, in the journals and at meetings and, uh, and when we see you, uh, you know, on the street. So uh, for some of us, uh, Isabel, you want to um, wrap it up and, and we'll, uh, we'll apologize for Brian because he's usually here with us, but I know he's stuck someplace. So Isabel, go for it. Well, thank you. Uh, this was great. And uh, again, it's very, very important that we connect. Um, and this is a great way to learn a little bit about one another. And thank you for uh, sharing what you wanted to share tonight. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. This was fun. That was really fun. Thanks, Thanks for everyone. having us. Right. Nice Thanks to meet everyone. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. You too. Have a good night. Bye-bye.